Thanks, Bob. Let's see, so there's a few webinar tips for you. Bob, thank you so much. We truly appreciate your leadership in getting out in front of this whole situation during this time of uncertainty. So thank you for your message. Now, I'd like to introduce our remarkable Joint Institute co-chairs, Jim Heisler of the Heartland Realtor Organization in Illinois and Bill Sterling of Newfoundland Labrador Association of Realtors in Canada. Jim and Bill, can you please let us know what we can expect? Absolutely, and thanks, Kyle. And, and notice, Bob and I were wearing the same shirt, AEI Yellow. Um, so, thank you all. Welcome, AEs, which of course includes association staff and maybe some guests. I understand that NAR leadership might be on here as well. But welcome to the very first video conference opening session of the AE Institute. I know none of us on the advisory committee, when we were planning this session going back to last May when we started this, ever imagined that this is how the opening session was going to look. It amazes me what a, an accomplishment we can pull off in a very short amount of time when, frankly, you kind of have no other choice. I'm so proud of what the NAR staff has managed to pull off in less than a week, less than a week. And we have nearly, what do we have now, 515 and growing people on the, on the line. You know, flexibility is the number one quality probably required uh, for us to do our jobs, and we're proving it right now with this opening session. Of course, this is just the first step in transforming and sharing the great content that was planned by the AE Institute Advisory Board. Yeah, and we certainly want to thank the, uh, the AE community in Canada and the United States. Um, you have been patient, and as Bob said, you know, you've embraced this change in plans. Uh, I, I guarantee you I would much rather be sitting in San Diego right now than where I am, uh, and seeing all of you. However, um, uh, we, uh, we respect uh, the decision to, that was made to cancel the uh, uh, As you know, it was not an easy decision, but our goal all along was, uh, was planning a curriculum that brought you the best education sessions, the best networking experiences, and, and help you expand and enlighten your career uh, as, uh, as you serve uh, our members, realtors across North America. And I want to sincerely thank the advisory board. It was, uh, it was this group that put together the program uh, that you would have seen had we gotten together. Uh, they did a, a bang up job putting together a top notch program uh, of subject matter experts and really interesting and engaging speakers with takeaways for, for you that you bring back to your office every day. So if we were all together in, uh, in San Diego right now, you'd see a big picture of, uh, of all of the advisory board members, but I just want to briefly very quickly uh, introduce them. We had uh, Mike Barnett from Texas Realtors. We had Martin Belanger from the Chambre de Moutier in Quebec. Uh, Suzanne Brown of Scottsdale Association of Realtors. Arlene Davis was our NAR board liaison. Kate Fowler with the Lubbock uh, Association of Realtors. Dave Garrison. I know Dave worked tirelessly on putting together some of the panels uh, that we would have seen this week, but Dave with the Florida Association of Realtors. Uh, John Gormley, uh, who I know is going to miss watching college sports over the next few weeks, uh, with the uh, Main Street Organization of Realtors. Darlene Hyde uh, with the, uh, the BC uh, British Columbia Real Estate Association. Chuck Caskey uh, in, in Maryland Realtors. Justin Landon with Lexington Bluegrass Association of Realtors. Jeff Lasky of the Main Street Organization as well, and Melissa Lindbergh. Uh, Melissa and Jeff were our CMLS uh, partners in planning this event and had great input as well. Take it over, Jim. All right, I'll continue the list. Uh, Mike McGee with the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors was on the committee. Veronica Priscilla uh, with the Boulder Area Realtor Association. Lisa Roberts with the Calgary Real Estate Board in Canada. Chris Dudebaker, the Realtor Association of the Fox Valley. Shanna Tarasso with the Realtor Association of York and Adams Counties. Jason Yoakum with the Saskatoon Region Association of Realtors. And no, I did not forget our Vice Chair, Katie Schatz. A huge shout out to her. She's been a huge help to both me and Bill and the NAR staff as we've gone forward with this process. So Katie, thank you so much for what you've done, but not to be finished yet. Arlene Davis was the uh, committee liaison to the committee. And then we have the incredible staff. So Sherry Watson, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sherry is with CREA, the Canadian Real Estate Association. She's been a great help. And then the NAR staff, who again, uh, with Sherry, have pulled this off in six days, which I'm just baffled by. Thank you for what you've done, Cynthia Baer, 
Kyle London, Cindy Sam Palace, and Donna Colzio. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't forget anybody else. Uh, all right. So with that, uh, Bill, did you have something else first? No, you're good to go. All right. Good stuff. As we noted, we are uh, now looking at how to repurpose the great content that was comprised in the 2020 Joint AE Institute curriculum and how we can share that content with you via different mediums in the coming months. We're looking at web-based training like today's session and perhaps some live programming, including regional mini AE institutes that you'll hear more about. This would feature live and web-based programming and a chance to network and learn with peers in a regional setting. Some projects that the AEI board undertook will continue, such as the charity project and the silent auction. We're pleased to announce that two days ago, the NAR Chicago staff organized all of the items that you so generously donated to the Monarch School for Homeless Children. The staff was able to compile 300 hygiene kits for those children. The kits should arrive at the school early next week, so thanks again to all of you who so willingly contributed to this endeavor. We really, truly do make a difference in the cities that we intend to visit. We're also happy to report that the AE silent auction, AEI silent auction lives on. The auction is still live on the app. So if you haven't downloaded the 2020 Joint Institute app, keep it up. Do so today or else I'm just going to buy everything and then I'll win everything and it'll be great. No, seriously. Um, bidding will close at 11.59 p.m. Friday, March 20th, so please get in and do some bidding. All proceeds from the auction benefit the Association Executives Professional Development Fund and the Realtor Relief Fund. And the contributors of those items have graciously agreed at their expense to send the gift to the winners. So a huge thank you to them for going that extra mile for us on that. Thanks. All right, so on with today's session. Today's uh, virtual opening session is just the start of what we are hoping will become a truly uh, AEI year-round. Uh, so we look forward to sharing the curriculum with you that was developed over the last few months. Um, and to get us started today, we have uh, Brian Blasco, who will share top takeaways from his session, Recipe for Success, Lead, Motivate, and Inspire. Uh, for, for Many of you will remember Brian as a highly rated speaker at last year's institute, and he was brought back this year for a command performance. Uh, Brian is a highly motivated, nationally known speaker, trainer, author, and realtor, uh, and you can see his full bio on the AEI app. Uh, but for fun, uh, Brian has traveled to 49 of the 50 United States. I don't know how many provinces in Canada he's visited yet, but 49 out of the 50 states. He hails from the great state of Ohio. I don't know if he's going to tell you what the one state he hasn't visited yet is, but uh, please give a great AEI welcome to Brian Blasco. Take it away, Brian. Oh, thank you, Bill, one of my favorite Canadian cousins. So I know you're all in suspense. I know you're clapping right now. We can't hear you because you're muted. But the one state I have never spoken in is Oregon. For whatever reason, the great state of Oregon has never had Brian Blasco. So, Bill, I've been to every province in Canada. It's a beautiful country, beautiful land. Okay, so my name is Brian Belasco. I hail to you from Youngstown, Ohio. I'm sure some of you have been watching the news lately with the coronavirus, so on and so forth. Governor DeWine decided yesterday to close all the schools in Ohio for three weeks, and um, beer and wine sales immediately went up as parents rushed out to the liquor stores. But we're looking forward to a quick, swift recovery with what's going on in the world, not just our nation or our state. But forget that jazz. Let's talk today about the AEI Advisory Board for putting together a phenomenal session. I am just one of many speakers that you will hear throughout this entire 2020 year. Again, we wish we could be in San Diego, but as life says it, not going to happen. So here we are in the comfort of our own homes. This program is called Recipe for Success. So what I'm going to do in a very fun, memorable way is I'm going to share with you four key ingredients for a well-balanced life. Short, sweet, to the point. And the great thing about this information 
it's applicable to your professional lives as well as your personal lives. So you can use this stuff <clears throat> as an AE, <clears throat> as a staff member, as a mother, as a father, as a friend, as a human being. So a lot of this stuff uh, can be used for personal development as well. And, and in hindsight, based on what we're going through right now in the country, I think everyone uh, can use a little personal development. So with that said, uh, if you have questions throughout the program, just hit them in that Q&A section. Uh, give a quick shout out to <clears throat> YCAR and Weibor if you're on. They're my Ohio crew. That's right here, YCAR, Weibor. Love you guys. Okay, recipe for success. Here we go. Showtime. Ingredient number one. <clears throat> okay. A penny for your thoughts. We've all heard that phrase, I'll give you a penny for your thoughts. So this pertains to positive thinking versus negative reactions. <clears throat> it seems like there aren't too many things in this world we have control over anymore. However, one thing we still have control over is our mindset, our thought process. The problem with our minds is this. We tend to favor negative thinking. I didn't make the rules. It's just kind of the way we're programmed. There was an article a couple years ago that I read in the Harvard Business Review, and the article studied positive attitudes versus negative attitudes. <clears throat> and here's what the research showed. About 80%, that's a high number, 80% of our daily thoughts tend to be negative. Now, here's the good news. It did not say we were thinking horrible, mean, nasty thoughts all the time. It just said when the opportunity presented itself for someone to choose positive thinking or negative thinking, 80% of the time they chose the negative thought process. Let me give you a few examples. All right. When you're driving in your car and you're approaching that traffic light, rarely do you say to yourself, it's going to stay green. As we approach, subconsciously, we start to think, it's going to turn red, it's going to turn red. Ah, turn red. I'm going through it anyways. Buying someone a birthday gift. Here you are at the mall or the shopping center, and you find this gift, and you think, ooh, it's lovely. So you buy the person the gift. You go home that evening. You wrap up the gift. You go to the party later on. You give the person their gift. All of a sudden now, while they begin to unwrap the gift, you're over here in the corner thinking what? They're not going to like it. Now, two hours ago, you thought, ooh, it's lovely. All of a sudden, the negative thinking kicks in. Folks, what are your first two thoughts every morning when you wake up and know you have to go to work? Probably not. Zippity do da, zippity day. Doesn't make us bad people, but why? Why weren't our first three thoughts this? Number one, thank goodness I woke up. Number two, thank goodness I had a place to lay my head last night. And number three, thank goodness I had a job to wake up to go to. Now, those are three pretty darn good things that a lot of people in this world don't have. But again, Here's the problem with our mindset. Because sometimes we think negative without even realizing it as AEs, as staff, as parents, we communicate negative. Here's how some of you might be talking to each other. Here's how some of you might be talking to realtors when they call in. Here's how some of you might be talking to your family and your children. We say things like this. Hey, I've noticed you're not really happy with staff here. Guess what? Too bad. If you don't shape up, they're going to ship you out. No one likes you. You're not a team player. You got to join this whole concept. Then we say things like this to our children. If you don't eat your broccoli, you're not getting dessert. If you don't clean your room, young lady, you're not going. You see, that to me is a form of manipulation. The moment you tell your child, you don't eat your broccoli, you're not getting dessert. Guess what you've just done? Yes, you, the parent, 
have just placed a negative thought or intention into that kid's mind that probably wasn't there before. Why? Because now all of a sudden they start feeling anxiety, pressure, stress. They begin to mumble things underneath their breath that probably aren't nice about you. What I would like for you to say to your children, your realtors, your staff, your coworkers, your association at a local and state level is simply Brian's broccoli theory. Listen how I talk now. For example, this would be interacting with, let's just say, a staff member. Hey, Sally, I've noticed you're not really happy here anymore with the association. Let me remind you of some of the benefits of being in this building with these people. We got more camaraderie here than anywhere else. You told me in your last job, sometimes you felt like you were alone. Here, we got you covered, blah, 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 blah. The moment I fill her mind with all the positive things that could occur, she now walks away tending to think more positive because you just filled her mind with those thoughts. But the problem is we don't do that. We do the first example. No one's going to like you. You're not a team player. I don't know why we have to do it. Just do it this way. So the whole premise, if you're looking at that slide, of Brian's broccoli theory is this. Always give people the positive end result. And the positive end result varies and differs sometimes from person to person. But I truly believe when people know what the positive end result is, they're more susceptible to buy into whatever it is you're trying to communicate. So with our children, it should be when you eat your broccoli, you will have dessert. When you clean your room, you can go. The last thing that kid heard you say was what? Go. What do I have to do? Clean up the room. Now, is it 100%? No, nothing like this. But I'd much rather have you communicate with people by giving them the positive end result opposed to scaring them into what might not happen. So hopefully this makes sense. And we can use the broccoli theory as a metaphor for anything. I mean, marriages that go bad. I'll be honest with you. I'm a product of that. Probably forgot what the broccoli once was or the dessert once was that brought us together. For some people at work, the only benefit they have is what? Paycheck sometimes, right? But there's got to be more. You can go flip burgers at a, a burger joint tonight for a paycheck. So what is it sometimes in our industry, in our location, on a state or local level, that's good? I'm just saying we need to remind people. I'm not saying kiss people's butt. I'm not saying spoon feed them. I'm just saying in my experience, I have found most people are mean, nasty, and negative because they have lost sight of what the positive end result is. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some mean, nasty, negative jerks in this world. I get that. I'm a realist. But most people who are mean, nasty, negative, I truly think they have forgotten what that broccoli, so to speak, is. So, again, when you eat your broccoli, you will have dessert. You say it like that, the kid starts thinking about Dessert, which is the positive end result. Now, they know if they don't eat that broccoli, they're not getting dessert. So it's just, it's just kind of retraining your brain. And I blame my parents, your parents, my great-grandparents, because it's easier to say, you don't eat your broccoli, you're not getting dessert. It's like Christmas. Uh, for those of you out there who celebrate Christmas, even if you don't, you'll be able to relate to this. If you have kids, uh, maybe your kids are older, but when they were younger at one point, I know – we have about 580 people on this call right now. I guarantee you more than half the hands will go up when I ask this question. Now, you can raise your hand, but no one's going to see it because we can't see each other. Anyway, who out there ever played the Santa Claus card? I'll pause. I'll let all of you raise your hand. Because if you have kids, you've played the Santa card. And the Santa card is what? And we usually use it when they're bad. We say, that's right. If you're bad, the fat man's not coming. Okay? We've all done that. So let me share with you a quick story. So I have three kids. Ben is 16 now. Uh, my daughter, Angelie, is 13. And I have a daughter, Natalie, who's 11. So 11, 13, 16. When Ben was probably six years old. I was married at the time still, and my wife and I said, hey, he wants a new bicycle. Let's just get him the new bike from Santa Claus. We'll double dip. We'll be like a hero. So 
The entire holiday season, though, I was very aware of how I spoke to my son. I would say things like this. Ben, when you get off the school bus and you come home and do your homework immediately, first thing, you're going to get that star on your star chart. Santa's going to see that star chart. You're going to get the bike, my man. Hey, Ben, when you are kind to your sisters and you help out around the house and do the chores you're supposed to do, you're going to get that star on your star chart. Santa's going to see that star chart. You're going to get the bike, my man. All I had that kid thinking about the whole holiday season was what? The bike. Now, he knew if he was bad, he wasn't going to get it. But why would I tell him that? Why would I have him think he might not get something when instead I could have him thinking positively about the thing he may get. So he was good as gold the entire holiday season. Christmas morning roll around, no bike. I'm kidding. What am I, a monster? Of course we got him the bike. But again, it's very easy to fall into that manipulation. So when you're looking at ingredient number one and you're thinking, penny for your thoughts, what did Blasco mean by that? The broccoli theory is very important because, again, it's just about communicating, giving people the positive end results. Um, I even wrote a note down real quick about an example of that. Oh, yeah. So it's easy to say, I mean, I'm just in, 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 in light of the situation, it's easy to say to someone, if you don't cover your nose when you sneeze, you're going to get the coronavirus or spread the coronavirus. Or if you don't purell your hands every two seconds, you're going to get the coronavirus. If you want to get people to buy into what you want, it should be not, if you don't cover your nose, you're going to infect everyone. It should be, when you cover your nose, chances of spreading the virus will be reduced. When you wash your hands really good, chances of you getting the virus are reduced. Get them thinking they might not get something instead of, if you don't wash your hands, you're going to get the corona. So, Again, even with what's going on right now, the more positive we communicate with the end result, the more effective the situation is. So ingredient number one, a penny for your thoughts. Now, I'm a firm believer in self-talk. Now, a lot of people say, ah, you speakers are all weird. Self-talk's nothing but a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. All right, I'm going to pull the audience. I know we can't see each other, and you're, some of you are sitting in your office or in your bedroom or in your house, but I'm going to ask the question, and I want you to raise your hand. How many of you out there talk to yourselves daily? Yeah. Those of you not raising your hand, right now you're saying to yourself, I don't know. Do I talk to myself? That's a darn good question. You see, I caught you whether you raised your hand or not. The bottom line is, we all talk to ourselves. You just got to be aware of how you're doing it because the more positive you talk, the more positive the end result. The more negative, the more negative the end result. Now, guess what, gang? I'll be the first to admit it. I am no superhero. I did not make this information up. It's been around since Socrates and Aristotle. It's something called the self-fulfilling prophecy. Many of you are familiar with the concept of the self-fulfilling prophecy. For those of you who aren't, Here's an example. Tell yourself you're going to win the race. You just increased your chances of winning. Tell yourself you're going to lose the race. You just increased your chances of losing. And I'll be honest with you. I am here today, okay, Youngstown, Ohio, sitting in my office on this webinar here today because of the conversations I had with myself yesterday. And I don't mean Thursday. And I'm a firm believer. You can take your life, your career, your association, your business, anywhere you want tomorrow based off the way you start talking and thinking to yourself today. You've all heard that phrase, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. Can that be true? Let me ask that question first. Can it be true? Most of you are probably shaking your head yes. Does it have to be no, but can it? Yes. Let me explain. This is not my first rodeo. So I've been a professional speaker for 20 
two years, which I know is very tough to believe because I look like I'm in my 20s still. I know you're laughing. Stop it. Anyway, uh, I've been a realtor for four years. I've been a professional speaker for 22. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Anyway, um, a lot of the work I do as a professional speaker, uh, numerous clients are in real estate, but I have a lot of other just numerous clients in numerous industries. But my biggest industry, I work with a lot in healthcare. And I visit a lot of buildings, long-term care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, uh, a lot, ironically, in New York. So we're going to have a little situational thing with that right now. But anyways, I go in and I do motivational programs and motivate the staff, line staff, kitchen, housekeeping, maintenance, dietary activities, directors of nursing, administrators, LPNs, RNs, CNAs, so the whole gamut. Anyway, I have been in numerous buildings that have gone from like, to woohoo, and I've been in buildings that have gone from woohoo to, and here's the thing I tell them, it's not the brick and the mortar and the paint and the walls and the carpet and the renovations, those things are nice, but it's the people inside that create that atmosphere, create that energy. So you as AEs and as AE staff or NAR situational staff or whatever your position is, okay, you create an energy in that office that I, the realtor, when I have to walk in to visit you for whatever reason, I sense it. Joe Public senses it. Um, your, your, your own uh, coworkers sense it. Clientele sense it. And it's tough to fake. And I've been in enough buildings where you, you can tell there's a lot of arguing and moaning and complaining going on over here. And, and I just am coming in to see my great aunt, but all of a sudden I walk through that wave of negativity and it hits me like a brick. And all of a sudden, I'm not happy in that building with where my aunt's living, not because of the paint or the renovations. It's just a bad vibe. So I'm not saying your place of employment has to be rainbows and butterflies. Uh, there will be days you want to choke each other out. I get that. That's life. But you got to be with each other a lot. So as AE, you might as well create that environment that is more positive, and you have the ability to do it. So here's my challenge, if you will. And I challenge most of the groups I speak to when I bring up uh, the apple theory. If one bad apple can spoil the bunch, which we know it can, my question is always this. Why can't one sweet peach ripen the bushel? I mean, if we can let one or two bad apples suck the energy out of our association, out of our building, out of our – why can't we be the, the peach who puts it back? And the good news is you can. You just got to decide, folks, every day when you wake up, forget the fact that you're an AE or a staff. As a human being, every day you wake up, am I an apple or am I a peach? Because if we get enough peaches in this world, I'm telling you, those apples will have a hard time making it out without being converted. Now, there's a percentage of people, no matter what you do, no matter how kind you are, uh, they're going to be upset. You can give them a million dollars, and they're pissed off because they're going to get taxed on it. Okay? There are just people like that. That's life. But the majority of people I have met, I'm a firm believer we can persuade them. You've all heard the phrase, you can't lead a horse to water and make it Drink. That's true. However, I believe you can give the horse salt tablets. You see, you can't physically make him horse and take, unless you take his big horse head and shove it in the water, but you can do something to make that horse want to drink. And that's the power of the first ingredient, a penny for your thoughts. Your thought process is way more powerful than you ever have imagined. So run with it. Enjoy it. All right, let's go to the second slide. Actually, the second ingredient, maybe. Boom. Look at those graphics. That's high-tech stuff right there, folks. All right. Um, a rubber band to stay flexible. Now, if we were in San Diego, I'd be doing a very cool activity. Uh, but guess what? We're not in San Diego, so no cool activity. I'm just going to give it to you verbally and virtually, if you will. I'm a believer, and again, this is just your speaker's you – know, opinion, if you will, that we should view change, especially in light of the situation, this, this, this pandemic in our world right now, we should view change as opportunity. Now, sometimes that's tough. Why? Because change is uncomfortable. Change is weird. Sometimes change is a big fat pain in the butt. Okay? Think about it. 
all of you on right now, all, almost 600 of you had to change your travel schedule, your flight, your hotels, your babysitters, your pickup for soccer and drop off for basketball. Numerous things were affected based on this one thing happening. But how you look at that event is where you will succeed or fail. You see, I can look at this and say, okay, I'm bummed out I'm not in San Diego, okay? But I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to have my kids tonight. So I will be with my children tonight. And if I were in San Diego, honestly, I would not be with my kids tonight. So although I'm sad I'm not there to speak tomorrow, the benefit, the opportunity for this change for me is I'm home because I travel like a maniac, okay? And numerous gigs are being canceled for me. So my business is actually taking a little hit. Uh, this conference was canceled. I was in New York last week and sent home. I had an Oklahoma program. I had a Pittsburgh program. I am going to South Carolina still on Monday. So that, that gig's still up and running. But anyway, change promotes opportunity. You just need to figure out what that opportunity is. So you're not in San Diego. There's a change. Stuff got hectic. But now how can you benefit from that opportunity? Maybe you get to spend more time with your kids. Maybe you'll save a few hundred bucks because now you're not going to go out and, and shop or buy something or whatever it is. But I'll prove to you that, that change is weird and uncomfortable. I think all of you can see me. Someone hit the Q&A, and, and, or, or Kyle, let me know. Can the audience see what I'm doing right now? I believe we can all see you, Brian. Jim gives us the thumbs up as well. So the attendees can see? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this real quick. So everyone right now, wherever you are, I want you to take your arms and just cross them like this. Just cross them like you're already bored with me, okay? I see half of you are already there. Okay, I'm just kidding. We can't see you. All right, now, when I say go, I just want you to change your arm grip. And what I mean by that is this. I want you to take your top arm and lay it across the bottom, and then you're going to take that bottom arm and bring it to the top. Ready, go. Now, some of you just went, where'd that third arm come from? Now, now hold it there for a moment. Who feels uncomfortable with the new arm grip? I do. It feels weird. It feels uncomfortable. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Sometimes in life, we make change more difficult than it has to be. Watch closely. All we had to do was this. But most of us, even though I can't see you, I know you went. All right, here's another one. Ready? Take your hands and bring them together. One swift grip motion. I'll show you the grip you please follow. Boom. Interlock your fingers. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Now look down. If your right thumb is the thumb on top, right thumb on top, raise your arms. Should be half the audience, believe it or not, even though we can't see each other. Okay, good. Put them down. If your left thumb is the thumb on top, you're a weirdo. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Where are my left thumbers? Raise your hand. Okay. Should be the other half. Okay. Now, open them up again. Now, when I say go, no practicing, no cheating. When I say go, you're going to bring your hands together to the opposite grip. But watch closely. I don't want just the thumbs to shift. The fingers actually have to shift as well. See how that's – but I want you to try to do it from the initial slam, and then I want you to hold it there. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Now, hold it there. Who feels like they grew an 11th finger on their hand? <laughs> it feels weird. That's change, okay? It's uncomfortable. It's weird. But here's the point I'm trying to make with that example. The new grip that feels weird to you feels actually normal for half the people in attendance because change takes time to adapt to. By the way, here's an interesting fact. I did a little research on right thumb versus left thumb for those of you who are curious. There is no rhyme or reason for right thumb or left thumb. It is not a right-handed person versus left-handed person. 
It is not a right brain creativity versus left brain. Here's what it is. When you were a baby, about seven, eight months old, and you can cognitize the fact that your little hands could come together and grip, whatever thumb went on top has been the thumb ever since. It's just a weird phenomenon. I have three children. All three children are right-handed. All three children have the same mom and dad. All three children were raised the same. Two of my kids are right thumbers, and my little Natalie, for whatever reason, is a left thumber. And that's because the first time she laid in her crib and realized her hands could come together and grip, she just happened to put that thumb on top. That's been there ever since. So ingredient number two, view change as opportunity. As weird as it feels, as uncomfortable as it is, I believe most people will appreciate change. Are you ready for this? If they know what the positive end result is. You see, this goes back to the broccoli theory. When you eat your broccoli, you will have dessert. Okay? When you do this new thing, this will happen. This will happen. You got to get people remembering what will happen if you want them to buy into a change. Listen, I don't know everything. Trust me. What I know I share with people, I just tell my audiences, take what you like and use it. What you don't like, don't use it. But I'm 47 years old, and I think it took me 47 years to figure out. I know some of you are thinking, he looks like he's in his 20s, but no, I'm not. I'm 47. But when we have the thought or, or, or mindset of making a change or, 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 or buying into a change, it gets upsetting. So here's what I figured out in 47 years. Most people will go along with the change if they know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. If they know what the pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow, they're going to buy into the change. Because if you say to someone, if you don't do this, this bad thing will happen, that gets them thinking negative. But if you say, if you do this, this will happen, this will happen, and this will happen, they're going to say, well, I want that to happen. Well, guess what? That's why we have to do it this way. So when you initiate change, there's actually two rules to follow, okay? Two rules with regards to change. Rule number one, if you're ever bold enough to initiate a change, I don't care if it's at your local level, your state level, with your staff, as an AE, as a mother, as a father, whatever. If you're going to initiate a change, it is your responsibility to tell people why. Okay, those are the rules I didn't make. Rule number one, you initiate a change, you tell people why. Hey, folks, we are changing the San Diego Conference. We're not going to go there live. Why? Because there's a world pandemic. And the coronavirus has spread and blah, 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 blah. Now, people might not be happy they're not in San Diego, but at least they know why. Most people are content knowing why. The problem is sometimes when we initiate a change, we don't tell why, and that's why people get PO'd. So rule number one, you initiate the change, you tell people why. Rule number two, if you're experiencing a change, I don't care on what level it is, and you're uncertain as to why the change is happening, you should what? Go in the break room and complain about it? No, you should ask. And you ask and you ask and you ask and you ask until you finally get the answer because chances are there is a reason. It's just whoever implemented the change forgot to tell you why. It could be a change from, from uh, uh, NAR coming down the pipe. You know, and all of a sudden we, we're doing something different and this is happening or the MLS is changing and, and the dues are changing and, and the super keys are changing. What, all the things that you kind of have to get thrown at you as AEs, most people, again, don't mind the change if they know what the positive end result is and if they know why. So again, two rules. Rule number one, you implement the change, tell people why. Rule number two, you experience change and you're uncertain, you ask. All right, second bullet point, and then we'll, we'll do two more ingredients and we'll wrap it up shortly. Benefits of interdependency. This is pretty simple. And I think we're seeing a really good example of interdependency right now with 600 attendees, six panelists. Our Canadian cousins have joined us. I mean, it's just a phenomenal thing that's happening right now. 
But here's the benefit of interdependency, whether it's as an AE or as a human being. I think I'm a very independent guy. Okay, Brian Belasco, independent. However, I'm no dummy. I know I am very dependent on a lot of people to help me get through this life of mine. Therefore, I have an interdependency. You see what I'm saying? The more interdependent you could be with your staff, with your, with your boards, with your local uh, um, and, and, and state agencies and associations, the more effective you can be as a whole. So you never want to be so independent that you don't need anyone's help, okay? And you never want to be so dependent that you need everybody's help. You kind of want to have an interdependency. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, uh, ingredient number three. We're moving along. Oh, look at that little poo bear. A mirror to reflect your self-pride. Now, I'm a big believer that there are a lot of people in this world you can try to fool, okay? But it's very tough to fool that person who stares back at us every morning in the mirror. We've all tried to fool that person. I know I have. But it's very tough to fool that person. And if you don't like the person you see in the mirror and you don't, have self-pride, it's up to you to make a baby step change. See, that's what I say and promote as a professional speaker. I don't say change your whole life because that's crazy. You got to make small baby step changes. If you don't like the person who looks back at you in the mirror and you think you're overweight, okay, I don't want you to look at yourself and say, oh, I'm overweight. I need to lose 50 pounds. All right, how about you lose five pounds first then you worry about the other 45 pounds. Take it in baby steps. There are times where I look at myself in the mirror and I go, you're a jerk for the way you just talk to your children. Now, it doesn't mean I hate myself. It doesn't mean I think I'm necessarily a jerk. But me, in that moment, I was jerky, and I need to rectify and correct that thing, not change my whole personality, just that moment. So, again, if you don't like the person who stares back at you in the mirror, you need to do something so that you have self-pride. And I think you should reward yourself more often in life. See, my thought process is this. We go through life giving everyone else the booty smooch. Then when it comes time to kiss our own rear ends, we got no pucker left in our lips. So I think literally you should start kissing your own butt. Not figuratively, actually, wait, metaphorically, not figuratively. Because I know some of you are trying it right now. I'm not flexible enough to do it. But you should start kissing your own butt for a job well done in life as an AE, as a mom, as a dad, as a friend, as a human being. Because if you're not proud of who looks at you in the mirror, it's tough for others to feel pride in you as well because it starts with you. That's why it says develop self-leadership. Develop self-leadership. I'm a big advocate of leadership, but I'm a bigger advocate of self-leadership. Now, if we had to define leadership, how would we define it? Okay, I'm going to give you a moment to think. What are some characteristics and attributes of a leader? What makes up a leader? What are some good qualities? Ready, go. Now, all of you in your mind are thinking different things. I'm going to brain or storm here and read your minds. And I know some of you are thinking things like honest, fair, trustworthy. A good leader is also a good team player. A good leader is honest. A good leader uh, is not too af uh, afraid to admit when they're wrong. A good leader is a good team player. A good leader is this. A good leader is that. There are numerous things, someone who communicates well, someone who's inspiring, someone who's motivating, someone who's empathetic, someone who's sympathetic. There are numerous ways to define a leader. Do you know how I don't define a leader? Titles. I'm not huge on titles, folks. Now, I know everyone has a title, and, and as an AE, an association executive, and then we have different titles like chief staff executives, and we have directors and CEOs and CFOs and COOs and PB&Js and BLTs, okay? There are numerous titles in this world. I'm not saying your title's bad. I'm just saying if someone's following you based on just your title, you probably shouldn't be in that position. People should follow us based on our character, our merits and things of that nature. And the beautiful thing about that is every person can lead. All 600 of you people right now listening, I don't care what your position is. I don't care if you're an AE, if you're a staff, if you're a realtor who jumped on here. It doesn't matter to me what your position is with NAR or Canadian. It doesn't matter. If you can influence, if you can do all those things we just talked about, then you can lead. You don't need a title to be a leader. Okay, Just keep that in mind. I'm a big advocate of self-leadership, which means you should develop yourself first. 
listen, I got three kids. I'm going to take care of them. God bless them. I love them. But I'm going to take care of me first so I can better care for those three kids. That's what it means by reflecting your self-pride. That's what it means by developing self-leadership. When I work in healthcare, I tell those nurses, hey, listen, I know you have residents and patients who need your care. And I'm not saying don't care for them, but I'm telling you right now, care for yourself first. Because I'd much rather have you love who you are so when you have to care for that patient, it reflects and bounces off of them, so on and so forth. So that's an important thing. All right, let's go to the second bullet point with ingredient number three. Find – now, this is my favorite ingredient, okay? So forget the fact that you have anything to do with, with uh, being an AE or a staff member or a board member or whatever. Just, this is just in life here. Find the good in yourself and others. See, I think that needs to happen more in life because too many times I see people talk about other people. And whether it's a political thing, which I won't get political, but it's, you know, Fox News talking about CNN and CNN talking about Fox and Joe Blow talking about Sally Moe and Sally Moe talking about Harry Joe. Find the good in yourself and others. Tell me if you've ever seen this before. Maybe even in your own office. So you're a coworker. You're watching someone. Let's just pretend a realtor came in, and you're watching one of your staff members deal with the realtor, and they're doing horribly wrong. Just for whatever reason, they're doing everything wrong. And instead of jumping in and helping and assisting and help, you just sit there and watch. And then as soon as uh, the, the fiasco's over, you walk into the break room and say, oh, my gosh, you're not going to believe what I just saw. So-and-so screwed up the whole thing. They were horrible. Right? You probably have to don't do that. You need to start catching people doing something right. There's something about us as humans. We want to catch people sometimes doing something wrong because it makes ourselves feel better. Stop it. Okay, life's too short. There's no, no guarantees. Newsflash, you might not wake up tomorrow. So you don't want your last day on earth to be bashing someone else. Find the good in yourself and others. That will make you a better human being. And I'll tell you what now, you get enough good human beings in this world, the energy is naturally positive. I'm a firm believer in that. So – if you look hard enough in anyone, I mean anyone, your priest, your rabbi, your deacon, bring the Dalai Lama here. We can find something bad, okay, in anyone. But at the same time, if you look hard enough in people, you can find good. You just have to ask yourself, folks, what am I looking for? Am I trying to catch my people succeed so I can celebrate them, or am I trying to catch them fail so I can talk about that is ingredient number three, a mirror reflect your self-pride. Find the good in yourself and others. All right, last slide. We're going to wrap it up. I know I've been ramming on. I'm sorry. Ingredient number four, a sponge to absorb life. Now, this one is totally a visual. I don't have it with me right now because it's just it loses effect, so I decided not to do it. If I were live in person, I will tell you in a moment what I would do. So, a sponge to absorb life, the main thing to remember, okay, forget the, the, the goofy title of sponge to absorb life, quality versus quantity. Quality versus quantity. That's the most important thing to remember with the fourth ingredient, quality versus quantity, okay? Now, I need you to visualize this, okay, because I'm not going to do it here. Imagine I have a large bucket, and the bucket is filled with water. Large bucket filled with water. On the front of the bucket, it says time, energy, and love. So picture that. Large bucket filled with water. The bucket says time, energy, and love. Okay? We are like a sponge. And every day we take our time, energy, and love, and we disperse it. So imagine we're a sponge. This bucket of water represents our time, energy, and love. So the bucket of water represents our time, our energy, and our love. We, the sponge, take our time, energy, and love, and we disperse it to multiple areas in our life. I'm going to focus on four. You may have 15. I'm going to focus on four. We give our time, energy, and love to our work, right? Heck yeah, we do. We give our time, energy, and love to our family and friends. 
We give our time, energy, and love to our faith, our religion, our meditation, whatever it is you believe in. And we give our time, energy, and love sometimes to ourselves. Okay? So imagine this. Bucket of water represents the time, energy, and love. We are a sponge. And every day we take our time, energy, and love, and we disperse it to multiple areas in life. I'm going to focus on just these four. Many days it seems like we go to that work cup and we squeeze and we squeeze and we squeeze and then somehow work squeezes more out of us. So we squeeze and we squeeze. Then we get to the family cup and we got a little bit of time, energy, and love. And then maybe time for a quick prayer at night or faith or religion or meditation. And when it gets to us, that last cup, sometimes it's just a trickle. Nothing left in the sponge. No more time, energy, and love. Now, picture that and know this. Those cups will never be equal. And guess what? It is okay. I'm telling you right now, it is okay. In fact, if you try to make them equal with your time, energy, and love, it tells me you're focused on quantity, not quality, and you'll go insane trying to do it. How do I know? Because I did it. Let me explain. I have one of those jobs I never thought I'd have. Not the fact that I'm a professional speaker. I mean this. I am a father who misses stuff all the time because I travel in my career like a maniac. When my kids were babies and I would go out of town, it was easy because babies can't cognitize if dad's gone for two days or five days. No matter how much we think that baby misses us, if they're still pooping in their diaper, they don't care. Trust me. Okay, but now my kids are 13, 11, and 16. The jig is up. Last week, I was out of town. I missed both my daughter's basketball games. Now, in the past, that used to drive me bonkers. So here's what I did to compensate. If I was gone for like five days, when I would come home from a trip, I would literally glue my kids to my hip, and I'd make them spend 24 hours of time with me because I was focused on quantity. Gone for five days, got to give them at least a full day of my attention. So I'm dragging them everywhere. Daddy has to go to Home Depot. We don't want to go. Too bad. Get in the car. So I think I'm doing the right thing. I'm compensating. I was gone for five days. I'm going to give them a full day of my attention. I'm going to be up there, but... And then my best friend sat me down and said, man, you're looking at it all wrong. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you should start focusing on the quality of your time, energy, and love. And let me tell you something. The day he said that, the light bulb went bing. And I'm telling you right now, I don't feel guilt like I used to. Okay? I'm not saying I don't feel bad. I'm just saying I don't feel guilt because I did miss those basketball games, and I haven't seen my kids. But guess what? It's Friday. I will see them tonight. Even if I own, now I'm going to have them overnight, okay, so don't feel bad for me. I get to see them plenty. But even if I only had my kids for two hours tonight, just for two hours, let's say, out of the whole week, it's okay. You know why? Because I'm going to make it the best damn two hours they ever had with their father because all I'm going to focus on is the quality of my time, energy, and love. How does this translate to you as an AE? There will be days where you squeeze all of that time, energy, and love in the work. And when you go home and your spouse comes up to you or kids come up to you, you're going to be like, not tonight, babe. Okay, but there'll be other days where you say, forget work, it's all about me. Hair, nails, makeup, I'm getting hammered tonight. Okay, there'll be other days where you say, forget work, forget me, forget meditation, it's all about the family. Folks, I'm just saying this. If you could only squeeze out a little bit of time, energy, and love for your family, just make it the best time, energy, and love you can offer them. Because if you complain that's only like an hour or two that you have with them, then you just wasted the whole moment you had. See what I'm saying? So if I have my kids for only two hours on Friday and I spend the whole two hours thinking, oh, I wish I had more time, I just wasted the moment I was in. So give it all the quality you can. That's the difference between quantity and quality. And finally, the last, last uh, bullet point says, great leaders versus okay leaders. And that's just pretty self-explanatory stuff. As AE, people are looking to you to lead. I mean, let's be honest. You're, you're, you're setting up meetings. You're doing this. You're taking this. You're making this happen. Um, here are just a, a few examples of an okay leader versus a great leader. An okay leader will tell you what to do. A great leader will show you how to do it. An okay leader will 
tell you to be positive, a great leader will actually be positive him or herself. Uh, an okay leader will take credit for success. A great leader will give credit for success. So there are numerous ways to define a great leader versus an okay leader. But the main thing to remember with that fourth ingredient is a sponge to absorb life. And whatever it is you can give someone, just make sure it's really good quality. And I'll tell you right now, you'll be fine. All right, I need to shut up now. So I want to say thank you to the AEI uh, Advisory Board. I want to say thank you to all 600 people who are on this first 2020 joint um, webinar series, I guess we're going to call it. And I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. Peace out. I'm out of here. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, if, if, we, if you could hear applause now, you would hear applause. Um, that, that was awesome. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, though, I am a left thumber, uh, but I was in Oregon last week. Oregon is the last state I was in, and it's going to be the last state you're going to get to, but you, you got to get there because it's a beautiful place, and they got the best Pinot Noirs in America, and you got to get there for a visit. Uh, secondly, I'm not a fan of broccoli. You can ask my wife, she'll tell you, I'm not a fan of broccoli, but I really love your second ingredient about viewing change as an opportunity. We are in, um, in a time where there's, there's tremendous change that's going to come upon us, um, and particularly with, with, with the coronavirus as, it, uh, as the pandemic unfolds. Uh, we're all in uncertain territory. But you know what, That's, as an AE, I never know what's going to happen when my phone rings every day. So, so we're always in uncertain territory. And, and so you've given us some, some great thought to, uh, to, to, to kick us off and to give us some, some, something to think about as we go forward. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so for, for folks uh, on the line, uh, please uh, be sure to check out the app. Uh, Brian's, uh, Brian's information is on there. He's a great speaker. Uh, we really appreciate his time and his commitment, and and I don't think we could have picked a better speaker to kind of kick up the energy and get this thing started uh, for for all of us. So thanks again, Brian. Absolutely, uh, thanks, Bill, and thanks, Brian. That was a great message. But did you really say <laughs> if you're bad, the fat man isn't coming? Don't tell my <laughs> my twin sixteen year old this; they're going to find that inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but a lot of times we say if you're bad, Santa's not coming. But I know, I'm teasing you, I'm teasing you. Hey, thanks again, <laughs> it was a great message. And to Thank attendees, you. Please, please stay tuned uh, to the various communication channels for future plans to bring the um, 2020 AE Institute content to you. This would include the Facebook AEI year-round page and the AEIMS email, NAR's NAR.realtor website in the local and state AE hub communities. And then for our Canadian colleagues, it will primarily be communicated through the AE Talk listserv. In the meantime, check out the AE's lead series on NAR.realtor. NAR is hosting webinar series specifically for professional association staff on topics that we together have identified. Yesterday's session was very well attended, I hear. The next live webinar in that series is scheduled for Thursday, March 26 at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The topic will focus on best practices for strengthening the AE slash volunteer leader relationship, something I think we could all use a few extra tips on. Uh, for that session, Travis Kessler of Texas Realtors, Laura Crowther of Coastal Carolina Realtors, and Ruth Hackney, I saw her on the line here, of the South Central Wisconsin Realtors will lead that session along with their volunteer leadership. So to register for that, just head to NAR.Realtor and search for AE's lead once there, click on the drop down for March and register for the live event. Well, that's a great idea, Jim, and uh, and it's certainly something that we can all tune into as our plans continue to evolve and continue to adjust in the coming weeks and months. So, for folks on the line, both Jim and I, as well as the entire the entire uh, advisory board, would like to thank you for joining us today. We uh, appreciate your your continued patience, your continued support uh, as we uh, we. We continue uh, to evolve our plans and try and, and bring you the professional development and the, uh, and the education that you're looking for. So stick with us, everybody. Uh, keep checking the communication uh, channels. Uh, keep using your hand sanitizer. Uh, keep checking the app. Don't forget the silent auction. And to close it out, I'm told it's a tradition to, uh, to kick this session off with the ringing of the bell. 
I couldn't find a bell other than the one we use at the front desk for service, so here we go. Thank you all for attending today and uh, and enjoy. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you soon for another visit. Bye-bye, everybody. See ya.